All right. I really, I really don't like talking. So, all right, here we go. A clean, hierarchical model view controller pattern for Android. Also, dependency injection and Kotlin, and basically too much stuff for a single talk, and also terrible, terrible title. Uh, work in progress. All right. I'll start with a warning. There's too much stuff in here for a single talk. This is a project that I was playing with for over like a, a week. And uh, I basically started testing out too many new things at once and they all got embedded in here. Uh, I was hoping to be able to clean it up a bit, but that wasn't the case. So, warning number two. This may contain a lot of Android stuff, and I know that not everybody in the audience is so familiar with it, so any questions, please ask. But um, the general pattern here is actually applicable to iOS or automobile devices and probably beyond that as well. Naming is hard. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. I went with hierarchical model view controller because after going through a gazillion variations on MVC, this kind of fits. Apparently this is a copy of something that was called PAC, which is presenter abstraction something, and never mind. Uh, let's not focus too much on the names of stuff, but uh, I'm open to suggestions on better naming for a lot of what comes next. So. To start, uh, this is a to-do app, it's a front-end for the standard like to-do uh, application. And um, I'll go through some of the tools and frameworks I use, and you know, especially the ones that will be mentioned and are more or less important later on. Uh, also to get some of the terminology out of the way. All right, first, I use Kotlin to write this app. Um, some might ask, why did I choose to use Kotlin? I answer, why are you still using Java? Yeah. There's no point in doing this. I don't think I need to sell Kotlin, it sells itself. You can use it side by side with any other Java class in your project. Just take one of your classes, convert it to Kotlin, and you can figure out the rest. That said, uh, if you do have questions about the code that is in Kotlin, uh, you just ask me, same as the Android stuff. Dagger 2. Uh, Dagger is uh, dependency injection framework. It's a uh, well. Who here is not familiar with dependency injection? All right. Okay. So I'll go over a lot more in detail about this later because it's an important part of, of having a, you know a clean project and all that stuff. But in terms of terminology, if you see inject along the code, especially it's an annotation, it means that whatever that field is, whatever that object is, is going to appear by magic. Somebody's going to put it there. It's not really magic, it's completely deterministic, which is important. <laughs> it's an important detail. Uh, components are what Dagger uses to provide dependencies. Uh, they're not they're important. Scopes, we'll go more in detail about this. It's also a, a Dagger thing. We're using uh, reactive extensions. Rx Java in particular, because there's variations for many other languages. Uh, we're also using Rx Scotland, Rx Android. There's a bunch of different libraries on this line. Uh, Rx Java basically provides with uh, asynchronous and event-based programming. The idea is that you have observables that emit events. This might be, you know, something like I started a network call and it comes back with a result, and that gets emitted. This could be events like I click on a button, and that gets submitted as an event. Uh, there are also subscribers, which is basically the action you will take on the observable when an event gets emitted. Uh, a little short example, because you know, we've seen things like this a lot. Over here we have a method it's called notify near home. It takes in this parameter an observable of locations. This means that this locations variable will be, or object will be emitting locations. It could be that I'm walking around with my phone, you know, I have the GPS on, every time there's a significant change, the, the framework says, hey, here's a new location, here's where you are now. 
Uh, RxJava lets you do things like take this location, uh, map it to figure out am I near my home? Is it near home? That will map it to a Boolean, true or false. I take you know, only the changes from true to false, etc. I throttle first, which is kind of like debalancing, and eventually I subscribe and say, whenever this happens, notify your inner home. Uh, RxJava has a steep learning curve, I'm not gonna lie, but once you get used to it and uh, to the names of some of the functions, it actually lets you, oh, yes. Yes, nice. Laser pointer. It lets you do things in a very succinct manner in language, especially for you know UI stuff that can help a lot. I'm um, using conductor. This is probably the least important things in this talk. I mention it because if people are familiar with Android, this will look very strange to them. Conductor is uh, it's a small framework that kind of aims to replace fragments in Android. Uh, Android has these things that are called activities, which is basically a screen on your phone, and fragments, which are sections of views, and they're both kind of plagued with very difficult life cycle issues. Uh, Conductor is a framework that tries to abstract that out. Um, yeah. View-based Android applications, they provide controllers, which uh, sit on a, on a view, on your view tree, kind of like you know, add in if you're in HTML. And they control the subtree of that. They also have, there's also routers, which basically are in charge of moving from one controller to the next, or from one screen to the next on the application. Okay. The motivation for this whole thing. I've worked so far in a, and seen a fair number of Android projects. Uh, a lot of them are horror stories. Uh, a lot of them are not, but all in all, they tend to end up being very messy. And multiple projects do that. This happens actually with just about any kind of programming, right? Like you end up getting very messy stuff. But um, when you have something like a mobile project and your messiness starts affecting the performance of your app, that's particularly important in a, you know, when you have to run your app on a low power device. So these are kind of places where you actually want to have very good control over what, what your application is doing. Also, uh, testing apps on a mobile device is extremely hard, much more than on other frameworks. Uh, a lot of the time, because it's very tightly coupled with the mobile framework itself, in the case of Android, you run tests, you can run tests on the device, so you have access to the full Android operating system. But if you really want to do fast unit tests, which is the only kind of test that you will write over time because the other ones take too long, then uh, you need to do things without having the framework. And mocking the framework out is not easy, especially because Android has these god objects, like the context, which does <laughs> absolutely everything. And uh, if your object has a dependency on a context, yeah. You're not going to be doing unit tests anytime soon. Integration tests are possible, where you just like run the whole test on the device, or you open views and you click on things, but they tend to be slow and reliable, and yeah, at the end of the day, it's not good testing. So, recently I worked on a project that was using this framework called PureMPC, which attempts to separate these things properly. Um, after this, I concluded that PureMPC is a little bit outdated at this point. The Java implementation is not all that good, but the idea behind the uh, behind it was very good. And I tried to create something more well, modern using all these other tools. So I started, I opened Android Studio and said, give me a new project, make it a master detail flow because it's a to-do app, you know, I can have a list of to-dos and I can see the details. It's seeming like it. And Android Studio gave me this. Uh, it's called to do front end, it doesn't have to do yet, but this, this is basically the vanilla app as with a very, very minimal change in like one line of code here. Uh, it's a list in an activity that is called to do this activity. And uh, to be honest, the whole structure of this template project is a little bit weird, but let's start looking at 
what's going on here in the, in the on create. So on create, for those who don't know, is uh, where and is the the callback that Andrew gives you to set up your view hierarchy. Especially when the TBD means set up the whole screen, put the views there, and more often than not, do some bindings. Um, at the beginning here, we say set content view. This is basically saying I'm going to choose this view layout. It's in a different file. It doesn't kind of matter. It gives me all these things. There's a mention of setting up the toolbar, which is this putting the title up here. It looks weird, but that's just how it is. Uh, at the bottom, there's something more interesting. It says find view by ID. And uh, it says if I have, basically it's saying, if I have this to do detail container, then I'm working with a two pane application. This is because this template, when you run it on a tablet, it's supposed to show the list on one side and the details on another. This is like the master flow, master detail flow thing. So this is actually not an unusual pattern. Uh, Android has some smarts behind that it'll, layouts can be overloaded to show different things on different cases. So let's see, what's next? In middle here, however, we're setting up the floating action button. So, there's nothing too weird looking here. In fact, this is something that you'll see in almost any Android app. They'll pick a button, they'll find it, and they'll attach like an on-click listener. Mm -hmm. So, one thing to observe here, even though it's very common, is if I were to want to unit test this activity, what's the next thing I need, I need to do? Like, let's say I want to unit test what happens when I click on the floating action button down here. Your dependency on the snack bar. Yes, I do. I have a dependency on the snack bar. It's worse than that. This is a, this is a static method call. Okay. There's not even a dependency being passed in. There's not even like a, an object that I can mock out. If I were to try to mock this in a test, mm -hmm. I would have to do something like power mock. Yeah. Right? Which, you know, does some really weird stuff with behind the scenes. And, um, hey, look, it's chained. It's make and then set action. And, right. goodness. Um, even if I did go through the trouble of setting this up with power mock, this is happening in the middle of my onCreate. So right. basically, to set this binding, I need to make sure that everything on onCreate can be run. So I need to make sure that find view by ID for the toolbar, for example, or for this to do this also works. That find view by ID, by the way, is a method on the activity. So to unit test the activity, I need to spy on the activity and yeah. So Madness. exactly. Uh, if I were, you know, I could try to like get this, this like just run it somehow on, on an actual like Android unit test, not on Java, but, and then get the view and say, hey, you know, let me see the type of the on click listener you attach, except that get on the click listener is not a method on view. You can only set them, you cannot retrieve them later. Uh, you could run instrumentation test, starts up the whole thing, clicks the, the fab, and then I can look for something that looks like a snack bar that appears on screen. <laughs> yeah. Now imagine it, if you uh, but have a, like a network dependency on this. This is also going to start like hitting the network. Yeah, never mind. Next, the recycler view. Recycler view is a fancy term for a list view in Android. That's it. Uh, again, nothing too weird here. This is cert call is kind of strange, but never mind. Uh, then says recycler view set adapter. Adapter is basically the data source for this view in Android. It's this one. We're creating a new adapter and passing it this dummy content items. Uh, once again, this is not injected, so I have no way of mocking this out in the test. Uh, this adapter is actually an inner class that's further down this file. This inner class takes care of, for example, each one of these rows individually. So here on bind view holder, view holder is just the name of one of these rows. Um, it sets some values, but more importantly, it also has an unclick listener because when you click on it, it does something, right? Yeah. Now, if you thought the fab one was interesting, let's look at this. When you click on one of these rows that the, 
the adapter set up listener says, if you are too pain, well, let's say it's not because we're not, so let's just stick down here. If it's not a too pain, like in this case, we're going to get a context from the view, there's a plot object, we're going to create an, an intent, which is basically saying, I want to go to a new screen, and then we're going like, to start that new activity up here. Uh, if you are too pain, there's something that looks even more complicated, but it's basically similar, it's just that it's using a fragment instead. Okay. This view has code that's directly controlling the, the flow of your application. You know, it's not telling the activity, for example, hey, move to the next activity. It's like directly embedded in the view. It knows about things that it shouldn't know about. Yeah. For example, it knows if this application is, happens to be configured as a two-pane or a single-pane application, right? Like, and the only reason it knows about this is because it's an inner class of the activity. So, like again, if you wanted to plot this out, now you need to no, you can't. Um, it knows two ways of do of doing this thing. It knows how to build the arguments for for like this fragment and for this activity. And this is not just calling a, a method like you know new activity and has the argument. No, it's like basically creating extras and creating like a map. It knows what the keys for, for these arguments are. Yeah, it, yeah. So if I were to, I don't even know how it starts in the testing this, right? Next time I, I, I run into a situation, I'm going to make cut. <laughs> yeah. Now, code like this uh, is, is fine in many cases when you're sketching things out, when you want to pass a code snippet to somebody to show, like, a, you know, somebody. But giving a developer this as their template for a new application is just setting bad precedents. So, Let's start cleaning this stuff up. There's going to be two things, and basically, that we're going to do for this. One is uh, dependency injection, mm -hmm. and the other is having like a, a model view controller or like a more clear se separation of concerns. So we'll get that to the second part later. We're going to start with dependency injection. What is dependency injection? Uh, we can probably have a full like two-hour talk on dependency injection alone. I'm going to attempt to summarize this. Here we have a class, it's a home notifier. It knows how to do something. It knows how to you know, notify, start notifying when you're near home. It needs something to do that. It needs like a, 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 a location source, right? And, and, and in this case, he knows how to get what he needs, right? He's saying, oh, you know, I just go to the location source and get the instance, like it's a single instance that exists. So, I would say that in a nutshell, dependency injection is getting rid of point three. Now we pass in what he needs to do the job. It's kind of as simple as that. <laughs> now, why? Uh, dependency injection pushes you to keep things separate, right? It keeps you a bit more honest about saying, this is what this object should be doing, and it's not about doing other things. Uh, once you have a lot of those location get instanced, they usually end up peppered around your code. When you have a bunch of variables that tell you, like, these are my dependencies, uh, well, it's much clearer to see that. Uh, it also lets you know when your class has, you know, 20 dependencies, it's like, maybe something is wrong with this class, maybe this needs to be broken down. And all these things are easier to see once you can clearly visualize <laughs> what I need to do my job, right? Um, it allows you also to do smart things like inject an interface that provides, you know, the, the actual implementation without having to know who exactly is, is doing the implementation. Right? I just say what, what type of object I need instead. Um, it's, yeah, it actually simplifies your code. 
because you know you say how to get dependency X, that's no longer there. And in the case that we saw just now, that was uh, like a very trivial change. But there are cases in which, you know, having uh, whoever is providing the dependency depends on a state of your application or other configurations, and taking that away from this object simplifies code, uh, provides easier refactoring with the caveat that once you're using a framework to do your dependency injection, it becomes that simple to add or remove new dependencies, and you don't have to change 20 call sites you know, to say, hey, this guy now needs one of those. I did in. That was interesting. Uh, <laughs> unit testing. Now we're getting to the really nice stuff. When you have an object that takes a dependency, in a unit test, you can provide a mock for that dependency very cleanly. Uh, for integration tests, this is interesting, especially in a mobile application. If your mobile app, for example, hits network, you know, you might not want to, you know, be spamming a server or having to deal with the latency of the server every time you're writing your test. You can have an alternate implementation of whatever the data source, for example, of your app is, and uh, make it not hit the network. Make it make it return some canned responses. Uh, the rest of your code doesn't need to know that you're providing an alternate implementation. And um, in the case of Android in particular, uh, you know, getting rid of de dependencies, direct dependencies on the framework stuff. Like if you depend on stuff on a system service or a lot of static calls because there's a bazillion of those or a context, you can wrap those up. Dagger 2 is the framework we're using for this. It's a Google's fork of Dagger, the original one. Uh, the original Dagger, I mean, from Square, is actually still incredibly popular. I think it's probably used a lot more than Dagger 2. Uh, what's interesting about Dagger 2, in particular, is that all its work is done in a, by annotation preprocessors and uh, code generation. There's absolutely no reflection used, which a lot of dependency injection frameworks actually do use. Uh, in Android, this is important because reflection is costly, and especially on older version, older devices or lower power devices, they make things very slow. Uh, Dagger also can handle nested de dependency scopes, which is very useful. <coughs> a dependency scope, for example, could be, in this case, like there's a dependency, uh, there's a component, a Dagger component that's providing things that are at the application level, across the whole application, like uh, for Android, an application object, which is a singleton. Every time you start your app, you have one. An HTTP client, you know, it's also a singleton. It could be, you know, a client to hit an API. Uh, you can also have things that are not scoped, like an HTTP request. You get a new one of these that are able to provide new instances every time you ask for them. Uh, this is already very good, but sometimes you some dependencies require additional like state or, or additional setup that you won't always have access to. So for example, in an app where you can log in, once you've logged in, you have access to a, you know, a user object, you might provide new things, like now maybe you can instantiate a friends manager, which is associated with the user, or you can create authenticated requests to the API, which you didn't before. So the idea of the scopes is this. You can have different scopes of dependencies depending on how, uh, what additional objects you're able to provide a dependency, uh, to the dependency to the dependency injection. In Dagger, these are called subcomponents. And without further ado, these are the, the, the scopes or the components that I'm going to be using in this application. Uh, there's a singleton component. Uh, in this case, the data source, for example, like the list of to-dos is actually provided here. Uh, there is an activity component, which you only will have available once you actually have a UI. If I had this thing running in the background, for example, I would not be able to create an activity component because it won't have a UI. Uh, this one could uh, provide navigation, for example. Now that I'm at this level. And uh, controller component. Controllers com are for a specific area of the of the screen, like one of the views. So in this case, 
the controller for this particular view could provide the adapter for this data. <coughs> so now we have that set up. Finally, we move into this uh, hierarchical model view controller of sorts kind of thing. Um, again, I'm not going to get too hung up on the name. The controller is just as before. We're talking about a controller is uh, something that lives on a view node or a part of your view hierarchy and it just controls that node. Uh, it will instantiate its view tree and it's uh, via, via dependency injection, it will have access to model and a lot of other things that are needed for business logic, basically. Now, there's a presenter, which is basically wrapping around the view and simplifies the interface to it. Uh, especially if you have a lot of nested views and trees, getting or making changes to inner ones might be pretty difficult. So view presenter is basically uh, an interface that wraps around it, just shows a, a simple API. And uh, we have a mediator, which kind of uh, is in charge of the business logic. And basically this guy binds to the view, to the view presenter. Now, this is all very abstract. And it's hierarchical because you can have these guys nested because you can have controllers in different parts of each view tree. Never mind. Let's actually look at an example. It's a little bit easier to see. So for this screen, this is the detailed view. This is the mediator for the detailed view. He's in charge of tying together, basically getting whatever data you need and tying it together with the view stuff. He has um, the interfaces for an for you know, a means of navigating, a navigator. And he, he defines the interface as a presenter. He, the mediator knows what controls it needs on the view and what events it needs from the view to actually do its job. So it defines these interfa this interface. And he defines the navigator because he knows like, when he should be moving to, to a different part, or what, what is like a navigation event. Sorry. He gets by injection a data source. Basically, in this case, he takes an identifier for, for the to-do, subscribes to it, and once he gets the item, he sets the title on the view, which is up there, the details for the to-do, right? And on clicks on this floating action button, he is going to go to edit this to-do. So, this actually, this little bit here reads very cleanly. And for purposes of testing, this guy needs a navigator interface, which is there. He needs a presenter and a string. Mocking these guys out is extremely simple. Uh, providing a fully mocked implementation of this is fully set is really simple as well, because uh, observables are not tied to particular sources. They just emit events. This is, the, this is the presenter for this view. So he wraps around uh, the actual view stuff. And you might notice that there's this app by layer, toolbar, a detailed view, there's a fab. All this is abstracted out of the way. When the mediator wants to set title text, behind the scenes we go and set the title on on the application bar, which is up here. Uh, the detail text is more simple. It's just like a text view, and we're just going to set, we're going we're to set the, the text directly on it. The clicks, the observable that are clicks to the floating action button come from here. Uh, clicks basically just emit every single click that happens on it. And I'm just going to emit these things until the view gets detached, so we don't get weird state. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, the way I'm seeing this is that the presenter is 
giving you an abstraction layer one higher than the Android view layer so that if you want to test the interactions with your view, you can test at that level of abstraction and you don't have to worry about bind view uh, and r.id, blah, blah, blah. You don't define those. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Just like the Meteor, I could do it with like a pure Java unit test. Yeah. I could actually create an Android unit test for the, for the presenter, for example, in which it's slower, but I can actually load a view and make clicks on objects and see if these events happen right. as expected. Um, and finally, there is the controller. He's in charge of the dependency injection. He gets his, he, he gets his component over here. Uh, the component does a lot more than just this, but the controller itself only needs these two methods. And what he does is also pretty direct. Uh, on create view, he just <coughs> in stat sheets and a view tree. And when the event of attaching this view happens, he gets the component, the injection component, uh, wraps the view in a presenter, and then takes the mediator and binds it to that. And that is pretty much all it does in this case, at least. So the nice thing here is that each one of these components reads, reads a lot easier to itself. Like by, by looking at it, you can tell what it needs to do. It doesn't, um, it's not all taught to get it into, into a single giant file. But yeah, what's You're worried more about the what and less about the how. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And honestly, uh, in future controllers, this thing gets repeated over and over again, and I probably should abstract into a base class because it's it's very it's just very repetitive. Uh, let's take a look at the list view. Wow, it doesn't actually fit in the screen. This is because this guy is actually kind of like two mediators in one. Uh, there's like two parts of this view. One is the larger screen, in which, in this case, he's binding to the data source and basically just getting every list of items. And whenever he gets a new set of to-dos, he just notifies that uh, these, this list has to be redrawn. And this floating action button here, which takes me to the create controller, mm -hmm. uh, is outside of the purview of the list itself. And there's like a, a second mediator of sorts hidden inside, which is the one that deals with each one of these, which one of these rows. So whenever I get a, an item, you know, I, I, get the, I grab the, the actual to-do, I set titles, etc. On clicks, I go to the details controller. If there's an error, I warn. In fact, it's not important. Uh, this part is a bit more interesting. It's the first write operation we see. Mm -hmm. Whenever there's a, a click, on the checkbox, or when there is a change on the checks, on the checkbox, I will take my data source and put a copy of this to-do in which I just change the state of the completed. Sorry, can I just ask, take until is it observable thing? Yes. Oh, okay. Take until, in this case, um, Every presenter has this observable which detaches, which just emits an event whenever it's taken away from the screen. Okay. Uh, so you get unsubscribed for free. Yes, exactly. Uh, for a lot of like the clicks, it's implicit because it comes from the presenter. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, actually, this one I, I could also remove it. There's another case in the previous screen where I, it was more important, like data source, right? Mm -hmm. Here I'm binding to the data source, and I want to make sure that I stop binding to it when the presenter detaches, because mm. there's actually an endpoint, and then I'll be leaking stuff. Right. Then this is the presenter for it. Uh, again, there's like two actually. There's one for the list, which I'm just skipping because it's boring, and there's uh, an item for each one of them inside. Uh, what's a little bit more interesting on this guy is this on is checked, which you know you could think of it as just a the checkbox, whether it's checked or not. But 
Actually, this presenter goes to the trouble of doing a bit of extra effort and putting a strike through on the text. Right? This is something that is just visual. The mediator itself doesn't care in this case. Like, it's just dealing with whether this presenter as a whole is marked check or not. But behind the scenes, we just add a little bit of extra. We don't put a strike through flag on the text or we take it away. The question for me is why are you doing that presentation style work in what to me looks like a getter? Oh, uh, this is not a getter, this is a property. It's a getter and a setter. Oh, I get it. Yes, I can see the number. Right. The get and a set. Get set. Like, uh, the get actually does only right. check whether the view has like a check mark. And whenever you change it, you're not just setting the Boolean flag, but you're also repainting appropriately. Yeah. Cool. Uh, this is the controller. The basic of con basis of controller I just skipped. Uh, what's interesting here is, once again, this is a little bit like a... The adapter here works a, a bit like a nested controller because he's in charge of each one of these views. And uh, even though it was not planned, he ended up doing pretty much the same thing. On create, when it was on create view, this is like a, a method from the Android adapter. It's like on create view holder. I'm just instantiating the view. On bind, I'm actually calling bind on the mediator just as before. So it acts pretty much exactly as controller, even though it's called an adapter. And uh, this enters into a little bit of the idea that there's uh, some nestedness going on here. Like there's controllers, mediators, and presenters happening at different points of the view hierarchy inside. Uh, all right. The edit view. Uh, here we're going to flip it around. We're going to start with the edit controller. It's poorly named. This one actually, when you create it, you may or may not pass a URL, a URI, an identifier. If you don't, this actually creates, which is why this guy says new. Mm. If not, it would say, you know, edit. Uh, otherwise, it's like a very standard controller, so we're just going to skip it. Uh, again, very standard presenter. The only thing interesting, interesting in this guy is that other than setting and getting the title text as before, we also have changes because these are now editable fields. So now we also throwing those out as events. And, uh, man, doesn't fit again. Let's split this in two parts. The mediator, when binding, basically Depending on whether he has a URI, he decides whether this is going to be a bind for create or for edit. Mm -hmm. Honestly, in retrospective, I probably should have moved that into the into the controller part, but it kind of works still. If if it's for create, I set the title to be new to do, and then I buy the fields. And if it's for edit, I said edit. I get my the data for for the to do, and then I keep a reference to it, set the initial values of the field, and then I finally bind the fields. Either way, I first start by, and this is, again, business logic. This is a little bit of validation that's going on here. I'm saying I only want to actually create to-dos if I have a title. I don't want empty titles for this. So since this is a very simple validation, I've done it in line. If you had a lot of fields that had a lot of validations, you can probably wrap that up in a separate class that can be tested by itself and then probably as a dependency. In this case, uh, if call it's... call a new to-do validator? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be something on the line. Yeah, I have it. Or just to-do validator. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, Right. If it's empty, I'll just I'll just start by setting the, the state of this of this button to you know whether it's disabled or not, depending on how things are. Uh, I subscribe to title changes. Uh, whenever the title changes, I check whether I should be able to submit. Basically, then I keep a reference to the you know the string of what what it currently is. And finally, when I click, which will only happen if you know if it's enabled. I disable to prevent you know double clicks on this stuff, and I submit, which will basically go back to the data source. I'm either going to create or update 
one of the to-dos, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to say navigator, navigate back. Uh, if I had like a network in between, I could I could very easily throw in more UI or something like show me a dialogue that is uh, you know the uh, progress indicator or something like that. And you that would be like presenter dot show async waiting. Yeah, and that would be right on the here right like do on subscribe right async mm -hmm. waiting and then do on complete. Yeah, turn it off. And finally, I go back. Uh, so we've been seeing these navigator stuff here in a few places. The navigators, they're all, in this case, implemented in the activity itself. The activity does very little. Uh, it's, it's, it, it creates its, its base component. Uh, it creates a router that is, you know, just for a conductor. That's where everything, all the other controllers, it puts a, an initial controller on it. And then it'll have the implementations for each one of the navigations methods. And since it has the router and it's at that point of, of the view hierarchy, it knows how to move things around. Uh, I, didn't get, I didn't have time to implement the, the dual pane one, but basically it would be very similar, like everybody else would just call on the navigator the same methods they are calling now. Mm -hmm. And then the activity would be deciding, for example, push video controller. Oh, if I'm two pane, and now it really is like, if I have two panes, then instead of replacing one controller with another, I could just push a contro uh, controller on my details pane or something on that line. Right. And, that is that. And I didn't have time to put in all the reference under. Huh? Can you share the source code on Slack? Yes, I will. It's already on GitHub. Available. Yes, Gabe. Okay, so you, I like your argument that the default template generated by Android Studio is you know, perhaps inappropriate because the code that we have today is code we copy paste tomorrow, right? It's just true. And this is setting up developers for more pain down the track. Do you think that it is the way it is because this does require more concepts to learn? It is more moving parts and like there's a, you know, as developers sometimes we have this, we want to push away things that we say, oh, that's too complex. But the hard part is figuring out, like, is it actual complexity, right? Or is it like you're just tightly coupling all your shit together and that actually makes your life harder later and so you should, there's some complexity you should deal with. And, and like, so is this the appropriate amount of complexity? That's my, my question. I, I agree, like, uh, it's very easy. And, and this is part of, again, of like when you're starting and you start with this pattern, it's kind of easy and when your application is still small, to just throw everything in together. And to be honest, to get, as I was playing around with, to this level of, of separating it in, in these particular parts, like the controller, the mediator, the presenter, and all that, it took me quite some time to figure out. What was interesting is that once I had those three pretty well defined, adding the, the form, for example, the edit one, took me like half an hour to an hour. And otherwise, how long would it have taken? I don't know. For forms are like historic. One of the things that I most push away from, like I hate do dealing with the forms. They usually have a lot of complexity, and it ended up being really simple. Once I was used to the pattern of, of having these th things in three parts, uh, starting just creating a mediator and not even worrying about how it's going to come to be or what the what the presenter view is going to be like, and just saying, "Hey, this mediator needs these things to work. Right. This is logic." write unit tests for it. And once it was all completed, I actually started implementing, here's a view and a controller for it. And they all came out very naturally. Um, I'm sure there's, there's points in which this will end up looking more complicated mm -hmm. than that. But uh, it's definitely something that I, want to, that I want to try from the start in whatever my next full-fledged app is going to be. Cool. I think that in general, Android doesn't prescribe any like folder structure, like you know, model view controllers, right? And 
anybody having to build a bunch of Google app is going to grapple with this issue along the way. Yeah. And I guess it's the same thing with like, even like iOS yeah. applications. Like, they don't tell you, okay, this is how you should structure your thing. They just say, okay, this is a recycler view, you need an adapter, you need a view holder, like that's it, the rest you can help yourself. Yeah. My question is about life cycle. So what you showed us, maybe it's just the code that you showed us was all about setting it up. And you used a lot of Rx, Java, and I'm assuming when you do something like take until it's going to spawn where you do something in the background. So how does it clean up? Rx Java in particular? Or in, in general? general, the way you've done it. Like, for example, does the controller get destroyed, which in turn will go and cascade into other things, or just trying to imagine how that works? The controller actually is, is surprisingly long-lived. Sometimes a controller, and this is just a, a secrecy of conductor, right? If you were using fragments, it wouldn't be the case, but a controller might outlive an activity. It might, the same instance might, like if you rotate a phone on an Android, your activity actually gets destroyed and a new one gets created. But the controller might be detached from the first one and put on the second one. So um, you have to be aware of a few of those things to make sure that you're not holding references uh, other than that, the views themselves, um, as you see, like, I'm not holding, I'm not keeping fields on the controller where it's saying, hey, these are my views. So I don't need to do a cleanup. And that is partially because I am using RxJava. If I weren't, I probably would be keeping a few fields. And then on, you know, on detach or on destroy view, I would be removing those as well. Now, interestingly, particularly with views, because another thing that's common in Android is that you have an activity or fragment, and you have a, a whole a number of fields that have views that are directly on there. So, you know, on the story view, you have to go and clear all them up. Once you have a presenter that is just encapsulating all your views instead, you have reference to one presenter. And on the story view or on whatever, you just say, oh, presenter dot equals to null, and it goes away. Right? All, you, you use the reference to all of them. So it actually makes cleaning up a lot easier. Whereas Thank you. Secret, we'll see a text message from me. I was testing Android security to see if I could make a text message come on.